A simplex converted to a Great Western Railway Prairie Tank, part 101. Cleaning up the live steam injector and changing the water overflow extension, plus fitting an extra check valve for the hand pump. I was going to leave this series at 100, but no, I needed to do one or two more things before I can do the gas-fired steam test, then the coal-fired steam test, and of course possibly running it at the York Model Engineers track, which is near York. In the previous episode, when I piped the injector, I used one of my injectors from my stock of old injectors. In this clip, I'm attempting to clean up the original injector that was fitted to the engine using a wire brush in my bench-mounted Proxon motor tool. It's proving difficult because the paint on this injector is really baked on. I need some help from this stuff, and thanks to my incompetent camera work, it says unwash, but it's really called gun wash, and it's for cleaning spray guns. I always keep the tops of rattle cans or aerosol cans of paint. They come in very useful for various jobs. If you watch the videos regularly, you'll know what I mean. When I removed the injector from the gun wash, it was very easy to remove the paint. After spending such a long time on this engine that needed a lot of attention, I just cannot refit this injector with this really badly made extension to the injector's water overflow. I mean, just look at the state of the silver soldering. It's terrible. And look at the way the pipe's been bent. That's not too good either. I don't know how people can do jobs like this. It beats me. I've bent a new piece of 3 16ths of an inch diameter copper pipe, and I'm going to silver solder this to the original part that screws into the injector after I've chopped it off on the bandsaw. You will notice that I'm not going all the way through with the bandsaw because if I do, the part will probably fly off and I'll lose it. Once I'd separated the fitting from the pipe, I put it into the Myford lathes chuck and drilled out the old pipe using a 3 16 of an inch diameter twist drill. Once I'd done that, I faced across the end to clean it up. Once I'd finished cleaning up this part, I tested the fit of it on the pipe and it's fine. The next part of the job involves re-silver soldering this new pipe into the fitting. Here I'm coating it with some flux, this is easy flow number two. And here I'm silver soldering the fitting to the pipe. I'm using some silver solder which is called Silver Flow 55. The part's at the correct temperature and the solder just flashes round the joint. And here's a finished job. The old injector with the new pipe is fitted to the locomotive. It should work because it's been in the acid bath so it's not good to be full of lime scale but I'll find out when I try it. This is the injector that I fitted in the last episode. Before I put this away in my box of injectors I need to fit three flat union connectors and fit some union nuts to hold everything in place. Now this injector can go back in the plastic bag with the other injector. These injectors were from my 7.25 inch gauge Titch locomotive. I mentioned this in the last episode, but I got the time wrong. These had been on the engine since 1996. How time flies when you're having fun. You may find this next part quite useful. I was going to include it in a model engineering for beginners episode, but then I changed my mind and put it in this one because really it is part of the simplex prairie tank. The rules for using model steam boilers state clearly that you must have more than one method of getting water into the boiler, so at the moment I have an injector and an axle driven pump. But I want to pipe in a hand pump as well, so I need to fit another check valve into the boiler, and this is how I did it. In this clip I'm making a mark on the pipe which connects the water bypass valve for the axle driven pump to one of the check valves on the boiler. Currently this piece of pipe work and the valves etc is a perfect fit on the locomotive, so I don't really want to disturb that. And I'm making quite a thick mark on this piece of pipe because I'm going to cut out 5 sixteenths of an inch. And once I've finished, with a bit of luck, the pipe should go back in place as it originally did. I always was an optimist, but as the job went on it seemed to work out okay. I don't want to use a piece of hexagon or a piece of round bar, I'm going to use a piece of square bar. I've put a piece of half inch square brass bar in the chuck of my Smart and Brown lathe. This is a four jaw self centering chuck and it's quite large. Perfect for firmly holding large pieces of bar or tube and also really good for turning square stuff. It is so useful having three lathes in the workshop. 
I use the Boxford for general work, I use the Myford for very small fiddly work, and then for anything that's square or large and very heavy duty, I use the Smart and Brown. This saves time. These videos take a lot of effort to make, and anything that saves time in my workshop is a good thing. I didn't have to do it this way, I could have just used the drilling machine to drill this piece of brass. But this way is definitely more accurate. As always, I start off the hole with a centre drill. Now I need to drill a hole in this piece of brass block without going all the way through. I need to be able to thread this hole, 5 16 by 32 threads per inch, to match the length of the thread on the check valve plus a little bit more to take a 3 16 hole at each side and that's to allow the finished part to be silver soldered to the piping. In this clip I've finished threading the hole so I'm rotating the chuck in the opposite direction to screw out the tap. And here I'm about to take a very fine cut just to remove the burr where the tap went in. I think this tap is possibly a bit on the blunt side. It's so old I can't remember where it came from but it does the job. Just like one of my girlfriends from many years ago. Over the years I've amassed quite a good quantity of taps and dies and I could do with changing some of them in my box of taps and dies that I use all the time. In this clip I'm cross drilling the block and there's no tolerance the drill is hard up against the end of the hole. The next job is to mark off 5 16 of an inch either side of the mark that I made on the pipe and then cut the pipe using the bandsaw. This may not work out to be exactly 5 16 of an inch, but it's near enough for rock and roll. Here you should get the idea of what I'm about to do. Once I'd silver soldered the block onto the pipe, it was time to fit the check valve. And as always, I used some Loctite 542 thread sealant to prevent any leaks. And here is the finished part ready to fit back to the locomotive. And by the magic of video, it's instantly fitted back to the locomotive and now you see what it's supposed to do. I've grafted another check valve onto the pipe on the way to the boiler's check valve. I don't always do this job this way. Most of the time I make a special block that holds two check valves, but there's not much room with the check valves where they are on this engine. I really do not want to polish up this brass and copper part, so I'm going to paint it instead using HMG paints sat in black. Not all piping to and from parts of steam engines is polished. Quite a lot of the water piping is black, sometimes it's red. This is going to be black because I want it to move into the background. It's an essential part for the running of the engine, but it has to be bent quite oddly to clear the reversing lever and it doesn't look all that good, but it works when it's in position. I painted the pipe and the adapter using etch primer then I allowed the etching primer to dry thoroughly before painting the part black. The paint of course does look quite shiny, but when it dries it won't look so shiny. I'm trying not to get the paint on the union cones, I just think it looks better that way. Plus any paint on the body of the union cones just gets scratched off by the union nut when you tighten or slacken it. While you're watching this image of the paint drying, I'd just like to mention something else. I have an injector, I have an axle driven pump, why do I need a hand pump? I think I can explain it the best way like this. So you're running your engine on a track somewhere. Maybe you've been very careless with your firing and the pressure drops and the engine grinds to a halt. You can't use the injector because there's not enough steam pressure. The axle pump won't work unless the engine is actually running down the track. Not only are the passengers getting very impatient and getting off the train and walking back to the station, the drivers of the other two steam locomotives behind you, also full of passengers, think you're a complete idiot. The steam pressure is starting to rise slightly, but there's not enough water in the boiler. But thankfully, you still have the emergency hand pump, so you can at least pump some water into the boiler to save having to drop the fire. That's it for part 101, stay healthy, thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful. Please take the time to visit my main steam models website and click on the section of the website that says video playlists and by doing that you can find other videos that you may like to watch and by using the playlists you can actually watch the videos back to back.